Hey, my nigga, how you doing? Hey, you made it. How's it going? How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? Doing pretty good. Just finished patient care for the day. Oh, nice. Yeah. So here we go. I've never. I've, I think I've always been on the recipient of this, never on the hosting side. So this will be fun. You got you got the you got the wash basin in the back. I hope you washed your hands for this interview. Oh yeah. All right. I got soap. I got soap. There, you see that? <laughs> You're a clean guy. It's one of, one of the things I love about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know it. So, uh, David, you, uh, we wanted to do a Facebook Live uh, video, yeah. and what what topic would you like to discuss today? I know that we have some overlap in the way that we do things. So, uh, <clears throat> well, let's uh, let's start chatting it up. Well, I mean, I think the the natural overlap, and where I've uh, recently had refound appreciation for you and Phil is in the topic of neurogenic inflammation. I mean, uh, I'm loving what you guys are doing with your dermal traction stuff. I think it's a really elegant uh, approach uh, to something that we've been dealing with for a while in, in our approach, and so much so that I think you're, you're uh, just about con converted me to, uh, to going about things your way, at least from the manual perspective. So uh, that's one topic we can talk about. We can also talk a little bit about... Uh, uh, some of the cognitive behavioral aspects of, of, of pain. That's something that I've actually been in a couple of meetings with this morning. I have not been seeing seen patients like you, but I've been sitting here where I am at my desk right now, um, actually speaking to, I just got off the, you got, thanks by the way, you were, you were texting me while I was on a call uh, on, a, on a digital conference, okay. conference, actually talking about this exact topic, and that's the topic of uh, um, the uh, cognitive behavioral aspects of pain from a from a kind of a substrate perspective um so uh rather than you know just kind of just, just straight at the behavioral thing so those are two topics we can talk about we can talk about them both i'd love to uh i'd love to talk to you and let's yeah let's let's do that but um before we begin uh why don't you introduce yourself in case any of my followers don't know who you are and, and what you're about and uh, a little bit about fnor and that sort of thing yeah so um i guess in that context in short my name is david george and uh i'm just like you guys one of the degrees that i have is as, as a chiropractor and just like you guys i have a background in rehabilitation um and have a particular interest in in pain rehabilitation um, I, I come from uh, a different, I, I guess I went to school on a different coast to you guys, um, to you and Phil, although our paths have crossed, not, not with you in the early days there, Justin, because I think you're a little younger than, than Phil and myself, but Phil and I have crossed paths in the rehab circle over the years um, at various courses. I think he, he and I found out by talking a few weeks ago that we, we were both at the first fascial manipulation course, which was kind of funny. We, we kind of both had forgotten that and then we both remembered it. So it's been that long and we're getting that old. Um, but anyway, so uh, rehabilitation backgrounds and um, I uh, also had uh, f uh, for a while there, uh, and actually I still do, but, but not as much, uh, have a, a neurodiagnostic company where I was um, providing uh, diagnostic services to neurosurgery and orthopedic practices. And, so, and what, it, what that allowed me to do was to be in the operating room um, around, uh, around a lot of spine surgeries. Um, and so they're basically pre-working patients up before spine surgery, being in the operating room when they were getting spine surgery, and then seeing a lot of them come back afterwards for post-diagnostics, like why is this person still have radiating pain down the leg? Have they re-herniated? Are we looking at an active radiculopathy? This sort of thing. And uh, over years of that, I got the impression that, you know, first of all, in each of those stations, there was a unique perspective. The, the first station in the pre-diagnostics was, you know what, the diagnostic picture on back pain is not all that clear. I mean, people that are get, no. getting diagnosed with radiculopathy and getting treated as if they have radiculopathy, as a matter of fact, in the, the, the diagnostic codes that are showing up on their paper are saying radiculopathy, yet I'm, di I'm, I'm doing electrodiagnostics on them and they don't have radiculopathy, yet they're still getting the diagnosis, right? And uh, um, you know, the, and the priest, Interesting. yeah, no, really. And then in the operating room, having people with their spine, with you know, going, undergoing spine surgery and looking up at the MRIs on the board, going, "Why the hell is this person here?" They, you know, this is the kind of patient that we see routinely in conservative care. I, you know, I just, and, and I'm not saying this is with every patient. I don't want to be overly dramatic, right. dramatic about it, but I would say that the experience that I'm describing happened frequently enough to leave an impression on me. So in the operating room, realizing that, you know, why is this patient here? This, this is something that I think could be managed conservatively. And then in the third station, seeing the patients afterwards going, 
that spine surgery didn't work. They're back again and they're almost in worse shape. And then seeing these patients that um, had failed spine surgery and now we're essentially persona non grata for everybody. You know, they're like, oh no, now that it's gone to spine surgery, it's the spine surgeon's case. We, they're done with conservative care. Uh, and now they're the spine surgeon's case and realizing that, you know, a lot of patients are falling through the cracks. Um, and my experience, I think, was echoed on a larger scale uh, in the realization that in chronic pain, we're, we're all failing. Um, and from that, uh, long, I'm sorry, I, I, for me, it's hard making, hard making, hard, hard making a long story short. But anyway, so, so that perspective, um, which I don't think is particularly unique to me, I just think that my per, that's my own personal way to come into the realization that I think many of us that are looking at the chronic pain problem and, and, and facing that challenge, we all come to that realization that, look, there's a lot to be fixed. So that's how I came to it. Um, and, and I was very lucky enough to... Uh, in that process, meet a very uh, a guy that became, I actually was lecturing to, the, I guess they're the largest orthopedic um, surgery group in Georgia. And the head of their physical therapy department, which is a multi-hospital system, um, uh, was this guy named Stuart Fife, who's a physical therapist. And I was lecturing to their group uh, in, uh, in, in neurology, so in functional neurology, and uh, found out that even though I was the one lecturing, I was, I was actually learning a lot from Stu, and he and I got on very well. And we decided to say, look, let's, let's look at this failed back population uh, of patients and let's just try and figure out what we can do with that because we both had the realization that, look, these patients are, they just kind of fall into the cracks and they end up with nothing to do at the end because they've tried everything, multiple surgeries and nothing's working. So we started with a population of failed back patients as a little project and um, over the years that became what is now known as uh, FNOR or Functional Neuroorthopedic Rehabilitation, which is the brand name of the courses that we teach that originally started as failed back surgery patients and then the lessons that we learned there we applied to the larger population of, uh, of uh, pain patients in general. So that's a long story short. So co-founded FNOR with my friend Stuart Fife and we've been, we've been doing those courses for several years now around the world. We've been lucky enough to do that. Um, and we're, we're doing it now. So that's my basic background that's relevant to this conversation. Right. And I haven't had a chance to take it one of your courses <clears> yet, but you were, you were nice enough to uh, send me the notes and let me look over it. And there is an, a, a crazy amount of overlap between the way that uh, Philip and I uh, approach low back pain and the way that you guys are. You guys have packaged it very nicely. Philip packages his very nicely in the course that he's teaching this weekend in Minneapolis, mm. the Fix Your Own Back Companion course. And there's just a lot of overlap. And in fact, we sent, we, and the cutaneous nerves, you and you, uh, myself and Philip have uh, stumbled upon these uh, cutaneous nerves and, and from completely different um, vantage points in a way. Yeah. Uh, we tend to t look at it from a mechanical perspective and uh, and your, your neuroprolotherapy is a different perspective. So I, I was thinking that a really good way to start this talk is talk uh, introduce the new the new Prolo gel and what you think the mechanisms about mechanisms, ah, mechanisms are behind it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just and then we'll discuss a little bit of the mechanisms behind the dermal traction method and how we can conjoin and use those together. Well, that's, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. So f first of all, let me let me uh, Phil, we try to have a conversation here, man. <laughs> you couldn't help. <laughs> yeah, it is actually a really nice package. But anyway, so uh, <clears throat> no, to, to your first point, Justin, yes, there is a lot of overlap. And I don't think that that's by, by mistake. I think that there's the truth is truth, right? I mean, you, you, there's some, some conclusions that you get to that when you're open minded enough and, and get to the point where you're like, look, I'm prepared to admit um, that everything I know is garbage. Okay, because you know what? One of the things in chronic pain, and I'm sorry, I'm going to I'm going to meander here just for about a minute, um, because I think I, I, I feel that it's at least it's important to me. Um, is you know one of the things that that bothers me is when people say you know look at the chronic pain statistics. It has to be you know the MDs and their prescribing and their injections. It has to be look how the medical system has failed. You know uh, no, and from my perspective, I'm like no, we've all failed. Uh, we we've been we. Yeah. We've been around just as long. We, we've been seeing pain patients as well. And we, we're, we haven't been delivering the miracles either because if we had been delivering the miracles as, as manual practitioners, as chiropractors, as PTs, then the problem would have been solved. We've, we've had as, as much opportunity. So we all bear the burden of, of a failed system. And, and I think uh, it's ne necessary for us all to sit there and go, I'm prepared to admit that everything I know is garbage. And I'm prepared to admit that I've been going about things the wrong way. 
Um, and from that perspective, I think it's, and certainly that's where we were, and I found it very empowering. And I think that it, I think you and Phil have also done that. I've known you and Phil to be pretty humble guys that are always open to learn. And I think it's not by accident that we've come to many of the same conclusions, you know, so uh, to that point. Now, the second point is to the peripheral nerve stuff. Uh, peripheral nerve sensitization is actually a uh, something that we can't do without. It's actually one of the first things that we look at uh, in the FNOR approach um, because it's it's ubiquitous. Um, what we found, my background was in nerves, so I was already testing nerves and doing nerves. So my mindset and teaching peripheral nervous system, so my head was all around nerves. So it was an easy transition um, for me to start thinking about nerves. Um, and I was lucky for that. I was very fortunate. It wasn't by design. So it's not like I'm some kind of genius that... Um, just out of nowhere, thought up the stuff was that I was actually already in nerves and just by coincidence and the nature of where things were going, I, I um, was able to capitalize on where that moment in time, uh, you know, speaking for myself. Um, but it's absolutely, yeah, that's- it's absolutely uh, a tool that we can't do without. Now, the way that we conceptualize the peripheral neurogenic inflammation problem is that it is a mechanical problem. There's mechanical components to it. And then there are chemical components to it. Um, Peripheral neurogenic inflammation is ubiquitous. We are of the opinion that it is by far the most common pain generator. And I think you've come to the same conclusion in your experience. Uh, I I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, it's an... Right, Philip? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Phil's just waiting for us to say package again, I think. But anyway, so... so, No, so so, it's it's everywhere. It's in every patient. I mean, you know, I I think it's so ubiquitous that, um, you know, even in those patients that have the radiating pain below the knee, that, 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 you know, um, that complex case, I mean, I'm I'm preaching to the choir, which I feel a little self-conscious saying this, but I think, I think we all agree um, that by going to the nerves first is a good strategy because most of the time you're right. You know, even if you haven't done the greatest workup, just, just by, how frequent, uh, uh, you know, how frequently this problem is encountered in the clinical uh, realm is a good chance that you're right if you just guess that it's a peripheral nerve problem. And, and I should qualify that to say that I'm not suggesting that low back pain can be simplified into one uh, pain generator because there's typically, just like in a functional model, that's the functional neural speed, there's often multiple contributors. But in our opinion, most of the time, the loudest voice is that peripheral neurogenic inflammation. So from the mecha- from, and, and, go ahead. Absolutely. All I was going to say is absolutely. For the biggest thing that I always see with athletes is somebody complaining of hamstring mm-hmm. pain. That they're certain that they, they've been told by the trainer, they've been, they've been told by the therapist, I have a tear in my hamstring. Mm-hmm. And then we do, do something to mobilize the sciatic nerve and then all their pain goes away. So it's kind of like, it's hard, not the fact that a very cut and dry, oh, it's just the sciatic nerve, but I mean, definitely a neurocentric mindset mm-hmm. is going to save you a lot of time in misdiagnosis. It's, it's funny, you and Phil, no, absolutely, and, by, and I should qualify, what I understand you to be saying neurocentric is to say nerve first, um, yeah. in, in, a, in, in a triage order, because for, for us, because I come from functional neurology, and we've been trying to rid ourselves of just thinking neuro, so we want to move away from neurocentric and say, it's not always nervous system and brain. You've got to consider biomechanics, and you've got to consider behavioral components, and, and uh, the stuff that you and Phil are, are fantastic at, because you've come from a very firm foundation in biomechanics and those types of approaches. Yeah. But anyway, so... And that's funny, because we go... You go, go I was just going to say, we go from the opposite perspective. Right. We went from a biomechanical model and then we're like, wait a second, these nerves really do matter. <laughs> yeah. So we're kind of all ending up in the middle, which is, uh, yeah, that's the way it goes. Right. So, so coming back to the point there, so you asked, there's a mechanical component. So these nerves can be friction. Uh, they can be compressed. They can be stretched. Um, um, and then there's a chemical component. So they are chemical mediators of inflammation um, that maintain this process. And, and what's important is those, those chemical mediators of the inflammation are not common, are not common chemical mediators of inflammation. They are not things that can be blocked by corticosteroids. Often they're not things that can be blocked by your COX inhibitors or your different, your very common, you know, uh, inflammatory, all the, 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 the points at which many of your common pharmaceuticals have been interv- intervening in the inflammatory cascade are, are not, um, are not, um, what we're dealing with in, in these kind of peptidergic C fiber family where they're getting sensitized that we're seeing in a lot of these uh, in neurogenic inflammation that's turning up everywhere. Um, but what happens when that, that chemical process goes into, goes into effect is that 
not only does the tissue surrounding the nerve get inflamed, and you often see that with the flare response and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, but you also see the nerve itself becomes inflamed. And when the nerve itself becomes inflamed, the nerve will become edematous, uh, and it will become fat. It will be difficult to move through small apertures and areas where it's restricted. Um, and then also the, the tissue, the, the mass effect essentially of the tissue surrounding is amplified when you essentially, you can think of it kind of like as functional compartmentalization. You almost compartmentalize that nerve where now there's an increased pressure in that medium. And, and we believe that within the increased pressure in that medium, there's decreased interstitial clearance. And with the decreased interstitial clearance, the pH starts dropping and it starts becoming more acidic. As it starts becoming more acidic, the attraction forces in hyaluron increase, and then the fascia becomes more sticky, and its ability then to full cycle mechanically irritate the nerve or increase. So our, our, um, we, what we like to do is intervene on the mechanical uh, level, which is what, what your dermal traction method is very elegantly doing, um, and then the chemical uh, uh, dimension where we basically short circuit the acidity, uh, and where we basically very quickly raise the pH, uh, and then we also antagonize that uh, or essentially block the receptor <clears throat> of the TRPV family and the ASIC family receptors that are then priming the um, uh, potassium and sodium conductance in the cell. So basically you're, you're blocking that family, the inflammatory process is blocked, but also the ability of the nerve to transmit pain signals is, is also lowered so that the, the, the resting activity level of the nerve is reduced with respect to threshold. So not only do you have an immediate response where you're not going to be expressing pain, but you also have an immediate response where that whole, that whole um, uh, process of edema and everything clears. Like you've seen that yourself where people will say, you know, they, they feel, they, they, they feel, oftentimes they'll express that in different ways. They feel it maybe as a restriction or a sense of swelling and that clears almost immediately, mm -hmm. you know, when you do your manual method. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and it's, it's very, everything you're describing is exactly some, the love of the theories. Um, we, we don't know in, in the dermal traction method that if we are affecting the chemical aspect of neurogenic inflammation as much, unless it's a mechanical reason. Uh, a lot of, Michael Shacklock talks a lot about venous congestion where the, and for example, like the greater occipital nerve in the back of the head, mm -hmm. and about 50% of people, it intertwines and twirls up with the greater occipital nerve. So they are actually one and the same, and they roll up on each other like a vine running up a tree. Mm -hmm. So if that venous network is um, compressing on the nerve, and then you do some sort of manual traction to affect that interface, mm -hmm. then it, in theory, I could see how it would affect the, ch the chemical aspect of it if it's mechanically derived. Mm -hmm. But um, well, as this, we have no way of studying this, which is what's difficult. Um, so, so what you suggest? Yeah, but I, so what you suggest? Yeah, but I think I, I think that stands. I mean, you're you're being humble there, and you're being cautious, academically cautious, which I can respect for saying we don't have a way to to, to study this. But but the truth is, Justin, to say, um, you know, before I even saw you guys do dermal traction, and you were reporting, you were, you know you know tentatively reporting your results. I'm like, oh, those guys are having great results already because we've seen it ourselves. And, I, and when, you, when I saw manually what you guys are doing, I was like, oh, that's, that's, I can see exactly why that's going to work and why that's such a great way of going about it. Um, but but yeah. you, you were talking about pressure in the nerve. It's not only in our opinion, you know, what's going on with the vasculature to the nerve, but also what's going on with the interstitial space and the perineural space around the nerve. Um, so it's basic, So think of those nerves, the epineurium and the perineurium. Those are, those are layers that essentially are, uh, you know, a burrito inside a burrito inside a burrito filled with a whole bunch of water, right? So, um, you know, basically when you, you could you increase intraneural pressure. So as it starts to swell, you, you're increasing because there's different things that are, there's, there's an osmotic effect. So as potassium leaves, by the way, potassium itself is highly inflammatory. So if you fire off a nerve and then the potassium's extracellular and, and hangs out there, it has a, it's going to prime pain receptors, first of all, but it's also going to have an osmotic effect where there's not clearance to basically uh, increase pressure, mechanical effect again. So sure. there's intraneural, but there's also perineural. Again, what's happening around that nerve with the inflammation, that those nerves are dumping like little salt cellars. They're dumping inflammatory metabolites into that region that are, that's promoting inflammation in all of those tissues. That's why it's, it hurts, and that's why when you go and rub a Graston tool on it or whatever your soft tissue tool is, you're going to get that flare response because that, the, that's, that's, that's causing that, that reddening that you're seeing as a chemical effect. Um, so so when you, you were being, you were being uh, tentative and saying, well, maybe we can't really say whether the mechanical is having a chemical effect. Well, I, I believe it can do. 
is that with your mechanic? I, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we believe it is. It's just a matter of like um, we have only clinical results mm. in clinical manifestations of pain syndromes and the reduction of pain syndromes to justify what we think is going on, mm -hmm. and and focusing on very key areas in which the nerve is shown to be superficial mm. according to nerve block, nerve anesthesia, and surgical anatomy research. Mm -hmm. So we're very much operating on a cautious basis. This is what we think is going mm -hmm. on. Uh, it definitely works, mm -hmm. and it definitely has sustainable long-term effects mm -hmm. in a large portion of patients mm -hmm. that it works on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a tool that, you, that we recommend that is, everyone should implement because it takes 10 seconds to test, 10 seconds to treat. And if it works, you have a very good idea of peripheral nerve sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And perhaps if you track that peripheral nerve back up to the spine and, and screen it, you might find the source of the issue. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. So that kind of goes back to the, uh, like, say, MDT or DNS or any of those spine-centered models. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so so I, I I'm I'm a little bit more cautious. So I, I know that you're 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 drawing a conceptual picture there, and I agree with ninety percent. Right. Um, but where where I get a little tentative is kind of when we say that all of it ultimately comes from the spine. There's a spine story to tell, because yeah, and, that's, that's not what I'm yeah no no I, I, that's not what I'm no, no 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 I, yeah. I I get that, but um, I'm just I guess I'm being. Um, uh, I'm, I'm running, running interference, You're trying to get out ahead of that in case people might be thinking that from, from, uh, uh, from, from that explanation. Because it is true what Justin's saying, that's, that's, that has been our experience as well, is that a lot of time there is a spine trigger because the posterior rami give off that little branch that comes up right through the, the, the paraspinals. And especially when you've got that increased extensor tone and you've got that increased compression at the spine, it's our belief that those little, little uh, and it's funny, it goes right over the facets. So when you go to pal palpate the facets, you can get the impression, oh, that's facetogenic pain, but you're actually palpating right where that nerve is coming right at you through the paraspinals. Okay. Exactly, exactly. It goes up to this kind of T-shape, you know, as it comes up to the surface through the paraspinals and then goes out and, and innovates the surface of the skin. Sorry about that. I'm using my hands to talk while I'm holding the phone. But um, <laughs> no, with you on that one, but uh, why I was being cautious about... Uh, about relaying that back necessarily to the spine was that, I mean, I think you've seen this as well, Justin, is that uh, it's possible to prime these nerves just by taking like a blow to the leg or, or a, uh, we've seen rib fractures where people, where people like, I'm trying to think of anecdotes, somebody getting a surfboard and whacking it into their ribs. Or um, uh, we've also seen this, I don't know what you've seen. Uh, actually, I'll put this as a question to you. Have you seen these, uh, these nerves be, be primed a little bit around insufficient muscles, like muscles that are relatively switched off, let's say? Um, sure. Let's, let's say the clunial nerves mm -hmm. and somebody that has like a, a spine-centered pattern instead of a hip-centered pattern, mm -hmm. and they tend to have ass pain because when they squat, they're overarching that, that go back to that facet dorsal rami conversation of the TL, where is it, where the colonial nerves originate from. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, if they have muscles that are switched off, mm -hmm. that, that, that do, does tend to have an area of cutaneous nerve irritation. Yeah, so one of the things that we're wondering with this is, is that's been our, uh, that's been our um, uh, finding as well. And one of the things we're wondering is that if you have these muscles, so like a gluteal complex in a runner, for example, uh, that's switched off, and you, and you start pushing them into these, uh, you know, you just start challenging that metabolism. So we're talking 20, 30, 40 minutes into a race, for example. You have that runner that starts to say, you know, 20 minutes in, one hour in, or whatever it is, I start to feel that pain. I can't reproduce it clinically, but when I go out, I start feeling it. I'm actually starting to wonder if not only are you systemically challenging oxygen reserves, but also at a local mm -hmm. level in that, in that muscle that is relatively now fatigued, how does, how does a fatigued muscle respond? Uh, it's, it's possible, I think, that with, with that transient increase in lactate, um, you know, we, this is an argument that's been around for DOMS, right? I mean, it's, it's not all lactate because lact, there's, a, there's lactate clearance. But remember, when we sensitize these nerves, we only need to pre-sensitize them before they are mechanically uh, maintained, right? So you think of it being um, initially set off with lactate and then sensitized and now it's me mechanically uh, maintained. So we're wondering if, because what we see is often these nerves are uh, associated with in, insufficient muscles like your serratus, like your glutes, 
um, you know, these type, type of things that they're often primed around weak muscles. Now, of course, there's probably a biomechanical component to that as well, that generally, if, if for example, in the glutes, if those aren't switched on, that you're not stacking your spine above your pelvis well, and that's going to potentially traction the nerve through a fibrous tunnel or something like that. But I think there's a, I think there's a potential chemical component to that. What do you think? Well, I was going to, this is going to show my bias of coming from a mechanical perspective and, and then going to a more neurocentric um, approach. But I was actually, I was a runner myself, mm -hmm. I was a sub two, th sub two hour, 30 minute marathoner. So I was, I was okay. And um, I actually had, I would back, so I specialize in runners quite a bit. And I, that complaint of it doesn't hurt until 20 or 30 minutes into a run is a very, very common thing mm -hmm. that I hear on a weekly basis where I'm running with runners. And when I was running, working with high school kids, what I would actually do is I would go out and go out and runs with them, and, and and at that 20 to 30 mark, their their biomechanics, their form, would start to break down, mm. and they would start to change something. Mm. Whether it was they're dumping their pelvis mm -hmm. into anterior, poorly controlled anterior tilt, mm -hmm. not that anterior tilt is bad, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. uh, and poorly controlled thoracolumbar extension. Mm -hmm. You could either way and as a result their ground reaction forces you could start to hear that and when you run enough miles i used to run 80 a week you can you can hear somebody's getting tired mm -hmm. you can hear it when they hit the ground and so yeah what what what, what, what if, if that's really interesting what would that what would that sound like what what are you listening for what are you listening for well when you run with somebody consistently over a half an hour and you hear what it sounds like in the first 10 minutes. It just sounds a little bit louder. So it's, it's, just a, a it's just a change. Crunch. Yeah, it gradually changes over the course of about five minutes. Mm. Uh, and their stride actually starts to get longer because they start overstriding. And, um, and you can tell that they're just spending more time on the ground. So not hmm. only is there a louder noise. Now, this is all, this is all like very subjective as shit. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> But you, you talk to a pitcher or somebody that's a very specialist in a particular sport, and you have something that's slightly off, and they're going to be able to tell you and be able to, and be able to tell. Yeah. So, but essentially, and this is this is getting to a place where I wasn't necessarily trying to take this, but I'm just kind of linking that bio. You, you, you talk, talk this, if you're talking to somebody that's interested, if you told me that you sensed a disturbance in the force and, and it was potentially, I, I would still, right, it's right. still interesting to me, you know, so, but anyway, go ahead. Well, when, 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 when lower mechanic, and this goes from the Irene Davis research, a lot of the lower, lower, lower leg mechanic uh, injuries are related to higher ground reaction forces, mm -hmm. a.k.a. hitting the ground. Mm -hmm. And the peak of the force mm -hmm. is higher and faster, which from a noise perspective would probably sound a little bit of a, more of a thud. Completely makes sense. So it, when they switch to that higher ground reaction forces with a over, uh, over striding a bit, more of a heel strike, and they tend to arch their back a little bit more. Mm. This, this is, it's really easy to see in a 15, 16 year old kid. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and it just, you, you can hear the sound. Mm. And that's when they start to hurt. So, so, so generally speaking, you're saying it's kind of like an increase in the amplitude of the sound at initial contact, essentially, is what you're saying, right? Right. Essentially, this is the way I explain it to patients. If you have an egg and you throw it in the air mm. and it lands in your flat hand without you dampening those forces, that egg's going to break in your hand. Versus if you throw it up and then and then disperse the energy over time, which is what your ligaments and fascia is supposed to do, uh, and, and your and your and your eccentric function. But let's not get into that because we we yeah. gotta open that can, right? <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm trying to keep this very simple to explain the concept, sure. that I'm, and I'm trying to say. Yeah. But essentially, you just disperse mm -hmm. disperse those forces properly, mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to run faster, more efficient, and the likely my theory and what I'm thinking, and this is running specific only. Mm -hmm that those nerves are taking more of a beating mm. when you get in, when you get into those poor mm. force distribution does that make sense it not only makes sense it, it, it sounds it sounds very plausible actually you know and then and then add and add to that the dimension that in general your your metabolism is going into a deficit anyway and that's having a chemical response as well so there's the, the mechanical and that chemicals so makes complete sense it's very interesting very interesting the cas it's a cascade result. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, and that means I mean once and then once you cross that threshold, everything that you do subsequently is potentially injurious. So it's not like it's not like the injuries happen and that's a solid state thing. It means you've now crossed a threshold where you sensitize. Now everything moving forward from there is maintaining or, or uh, provoking or you know aggravating the problem, right? 
Yeah, and to take it one step further, when I'm running with these kids, I just tell them to kind of get their ribs down a little bit, mm. and then they they generally feel better, <laughs> and then they can run another, and then we run another twenty or thirty minutes when they hadn't been able to do that in the past. Mm. Interesting. So, uh, that's 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 my very specific example, and I, and I'm a running specific guy. Yeah. I work with all sports, but that's that's. I mean, I spent ten years of my life running yeah a lot so um one of the things that that we do with with runners and endurance athletes is even when they're not so even though the 20 or 30 minutes we'll have them apply a topical uh, uh basically before preemptively before they run on the entire mm -hmm. on the entire distribution of the nerve so that as they run it gets absorbed um and actually they don't manifest the pain when, when you guys do the dtm are you finding that even when the patient is non-symptomatic you might be applying your technique manually before I, before i actually teach the athletes that i work with that it's a very very simple thing to do as part of their warm-up mm. a dynamic warm -up. so uh, what a great concept a very yeah so it's more it's just like you're just getting your tissues ready for battle essentially and uh, your skin is part of the tissue of your body so what how is it any different than, <clears throat> um, than warming up your your calves before you run a 5k so, you know, if you want to get in there and skin roll a little bit and move it, move it around, I, I, don't see, I, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't just be warming up another tissue that you're about to stress. It's a fantastic concept. But you say, you say, you say uh, what a great concept. That's so cool. So you, so you uh, I mean, are you doing the full, the full deal? Um, are you applying, uh, I, I noticed, I mean, there's a, there's a manual component and there's also the use of, you guys use cups. We've also used them, but again, I'm going to admit that I think that you guys have a much more elegant way of going about it. Um, but do you use the cups also as part of the warm-up, or do you have them do manual things? Or I, I, I don't use the cups hardly at all, to be honest with you. It's just an option. Mm -hmm. The only time I ever use a cup is if I'm looking at the saphenous nerve just above the medial malleolus because mm -hmm. I can't get my hands in there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm sidelined sports medicine a lot, mm -hmm. so to carry around cups and stuff is just like an, an inconvenience. I'm just, it's my hands and movement and let's feel better now. Mm -hmm. And if we have an issue that needs more attention, we'll do more in an off time. But if it's, <coughs> if it's sidelined on a practice like China or, I'm, or when I work with co uh, colleges here in the LA area or high schools, it's um, it's very much like let's get you feeling better right now, so you can continue this this particular workout that's for, important in your training programming, and then fix the issue again afterwards. That so. that saphenous nerve, those those retinacula, um, you know, anywhere where you have retinacula, whether it's the superficial radial at the at the wrist or the, the retinacula at the ankle, those are problematic, man. They end up they end up being like uh, like little cheese graters. Because there's, there's, so, there's so, such a little cushion where the nerves generally cross over retinacula in the body. I mean, if you look at your, you know, that right there where that superficial radial passes, you know, at the dorsum of your hand into the thumb, at the, at the ankle, those are those, that's a, that's a common area that gets provoked. So over those areas, we have a we have a rule where we say no. So your technique, as I understand it, is is dominated by negative technique. Well, we okay. So let me take a step back. We conceptualize the manual techniques the, for nerves as falling into two categories positive pressure and negative pressure. Negative pressure is defined as those where, you're, where you'll be creating a negative pressure by essentially pulling the tissue up away from the body. So there's a negative pressure relative to where the nerve is. Uh, and then a positive pressure would be something like, like a trigger point where you're pressing down. We have, a, we have a rule that we try and go say no positive pressure over bones and it's also kind of over retinacular for a similar reason. So what we found is that actually sometimes if you apply pressure around the nerve at the retinaculum to mobilize the retinaculum, so as it crosses there, um, that's, that's sometimes helpful for us. I don't know if you've, you've tried that, whereby addressing the retinaculum instead of trying to do it manually to go negative. Do you do? Well, uh, I would say that we, we work that entire area, which would include the retinaculum. Uh, and also, just as a caveat, and this is something that help, I think helps understand why I don't use what you would call positive pressure. Mm -hmm. is, and, this is, and I got to refine this strain of research. Uh, my hard drive cash crashed and I lost this. But essentially, let's, let's go from a different vein of research and go into a cancer patient. <clears throat> cancer, cancer patients have a lot of neurogenic pain. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why they think that they're having such neurogenic pain, especially with like chemotherapy, mm -hmm. is because their fat is so much less in their body. Mm -hmm. And fat acts as a cushion. And if there's less cushion around nerves, just like we, then you have more. Just like we were just talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So Appy's Regnaculum, it could be just as simple as the fact is there's really no body fat. Mm. So, I mean, so that's, that's kind of where I go with it. That's where my mind goes with it. There's like, well, it makes sense. You're in, there's nothing there to spare it from compression. Absolutely. Well, well also, the, there's also generally where the retinacula is, they're, they're pretty close to the joints. So that's the point where the greatest friction is. There's, there's a lot of travel over that. That's the, that's the pivot point of the pulley as well, you know. So I think that a lot of factors. Absolutely. I absolutely agree, agree with that. Um, so the saphenous nerve is where dermal traction technique all started for the most part, like specifically at the adductor hiatus at the knee. It was, you know, just somebody having pain with squatting. We're like, hmm, that saphenous nerve's there. How would we create traction mm. in it? And uh, we started pulling on the skin there while people were doing squats, Philip and I. And essentially, that was one of that's what kind of got it started. And then we worked down to the ankle. <clears throat> and, um, and then we just extrapolated. And then every single day, we'd be going into the office and be like, oh, what about this spot? What, 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 what would we do there? And then it, it just kind of turned into the entire body. So, so, you, so, for you, so for you guys, it started at the knee. For, for us, it started at the knee. Which was an area, like, remember, I'm a low, both Philip and I are kind of like, he was a runner, I was a runner. Mm -hmm. So we were seeing a lot of runners, and we were seeing a lot of lower limb complaints. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we were having great success with just functional rehab, that we, just techniques that we had, mm -hmm. uh, Steco and some neurodynamic mm -hmm. techniques. But uh, after taking Michael Shacklock's courses, when he was talking about um, the, the mechanical, um, mechanical pressures and how it relates to nerves, we started wondering... How does that relate to cutaneous nerves? Because Philip, for years, has been – he's the one that taught me about clunial nerves in the back, and he would get in there and skin roll. Mm -hmm. and, we'll, and both of us were like, well, how do we apply this aspect to the body, and what does it make sense? And that's, that's, that's how we jumped. That's how we made that little jump, and, and we applied it to the – So can I – I'll take a guess. <clears throat> I guess I'm going to bet that you had a bunch of people that insist that their persistent medial knee pain is from their – previous meniscus injury and you ended up treating that saphenous nerve and you know knocked it out of the park and that was the end of that right yeah I mean, all the time right? yeah <laughs> i mean i mean anybody anybody at all that has knee pain is always a meniscus and that's what they always yeah. say well phil, phil says it, phil, say, phil says he's checking into the hotel so he's jumping off no problem we'll see, uh, see you next time phil i'll see you next time yeah. so yeah and speaking of the saphenous nerve it blends it actually pierces and blends into and innervates the MCL. That's right, little, little pieces, so, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, from a force perspective, if you're the same forces that would stress and irritate a meniscus would stress and irritate the saphenous nerve. Yeah, for sure. So, so what, are you, what, what are you guys doing with this stuff? <clears throat> well, with uh, the dermal traction method? Yeah, what do you, you got some courses. Kind of, I've seen fills popping up everywhere, and I know all of us were... Talk, talking about do, do, doing something and we're all getting busy, but I, I don't know what you're up to with your DTM stuff these days. Well, I mean, I'm still teaching courses. Um, I, I, was, I was away in China for a year, so that kind of killed my momentum. I taught, I think, like eight or nine or, I don't know, 10 in 2016, and then I left. So now I'm coming back. I'm teaching a course, and we're actually going to do a Facebook Live video on Sunday with Eric Harrelson. We're going to talk about me coming up to Minneapolis and doing a... Uh, a clinical audit process, basically the way I look and examine mm -hmm. patients and kind of like the, this is what really works, this pattern that I've noticed, uh, kind of my take on uh, a lot of different systems. Yeah. And then <clears throat> add dermal traction, dermal traction slash yank away pain yeah. um, methodology. So, so, so one, one thing you mentioned before, so ha have, you, uh, have you been using, uh, using gel with your stuff or are you still strictly manual? That was one of the things we... We spoke, we said we were going to talk about it a little bit to integrate them. Um, so the way that I do it, I definitely, I do, if I have a difficult patient where, say, the dermal traction only gives me, say, 50% reduction of symptoms, mm. but I'm pretty certain that, that that peripheral nerve's pretty freaking important and I'm not getting good results other places, I add in, the, I add in your gel mm. to give me that extra little oomph. Yeah. And part of that comes from the insecurity of being a young doc and always having to prove myself to patients because <laughs> they think I yeah. don't know anything. So I'm trying to hit it out of the park every single day, yeah. which is kind of the way I go, go about things. So I do manual first, and then I add the neuroprolo gel. Mm. Well, actually, that's just the way. I yeah, you know, actually, Stu and I have also been playing with that a little bit as well. Is that um, we would 
our protocol was first to use the gel diagnostically. So we apply and then the person will have like an 80 to 100% reduction typically because if it's right on the nerve, it works. And then we'll go, oh, okay. Now that, now that the, pain, the, the, the pain is significantly less or eliminated, now we go manual to mechanically liberate it. Because our thought is, you know, you, you've probably seen a lot of times with the manual techniques that if you don't do a complete job, the nerve is provoked and the person ends up aggravated afterwards. And they're like, oh, man, I was sore after that or whatever. Um, and then we would, so we go manual and then we do the, the topical afterwards. But I will say this is that since we were playing around with your, your guys' stuff, um, we actually have lately been try saying, you know, let's not go on the skin with the gel until we're done. Um, so let's, let's uh, do a little bit of the, the manual stuff um, and playing with some of your guys' stuff first and then doing the gel afterwards. So we have been playing with it that way. Uh, and I know Stu gave me a call a couple of weeks ago and said that he's actually had a, he had a series of a few cases where he did it that way, where he did your guys' uh, approach um, and then uh, put the gel on afterwards because it was like a res small, small resume and he liked it. He, he thought it was more efficient. He also thought it was a little bit cleaner as well because he wasn't getting as much gel on his hands, um, you know, mm -hmm. by doing the manual. So he did your thing, cleaned up as much as he could and then did the gel after. So it has been useful in that way, you know? Right. And I, and I do it, I do it the manual. <clears throat> I, I, there was, I wouldn't necessarily say that there was extreme thought that went into why I did uh, the dermal traction first and then the prolo. It merely just has to do with how I treat. I don't, like it's it's kind of an inconvenience for me to like go and get the gel and you know I'm gonna do my thing right. and get as much results as fast as possible, get as much information as fast as possible, and then put the icing on the cake. And that goes along with being sideline sports medicine, working with athletes in 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 combat zones. So so for, for you for you it's the process is evolving in front of you and you want to react to it you know constantly and then keep your hands clear, keep it uncomplicated, and keep yourself flexible, and then maybe use that as a finisher. I like that. I like that. Like yeah, yeah and, that's the way, and that's essentially what I teach in my courses is, is, is um, have a general schematic of what you want to do, yeah. but, it be, but without, without, doubt, without a doubt, be able to adjust on the fly to what a particular orthopedic movement test or treatment intervention does yeah. so that you can quickly adjust and, and move into a different direction if you need to or jump a stage ahead if you need to. And it's more just – it's very much a – it's a it's a dynamic state. No, I like that. Much like playing sports. You know, yeah. no, I like that. I like that a lot. I've actually seen seen you doing doing some of your stuff, and I actually I, I get that now that you say that it makes complete sense. Is that you want to be able to move and, and roll with the process a little bit, and then and then, I like that. It's, it's actually made me think about it a little bit. Um, but you know, I want to go, go, go back go back to a point that you made. You know, you almost apologetically made this point where you're like, ah, oh, you're a young doc and you like to hit it out of the park. I think. I think that a lot of people, I think it's a good thing, Justin, you know, I mean, I think, uh, I don't think it's unique to being young. I think it's very powerful when, when you can, when a, when a patient can come in on the first day um, and you can significantly reduce or eliminate their pain, even when you know that it might not last. I think it's good for that relationship. And it's also good to say, hey, listen, if I can press and feel and know where you hurt, even if that's not where you're telling me you hurt, and I can understand your pain, I can touch and feel it. And I can also influence it in a unique way i think it's a powerful position so i think hitting there's a there's a value to hitting it out of the park i think most patients hope you hit it out of the park right on day one so oh, sure yeah it's not necessarily best for your wallet in the beginning but, <laughs> you know it, it, higher turnover higher turnover i just started to practice here in la yeah picking up pretty fast you know you know that's that's, so, uh, that's that's one of the challenges you know it's um uh, um sorry i said somebody pop up on my phone um Okay. is one of the challenges that we, you know, we thought as well when we came up with, with our nerve stuff and we came up with, you know, the, the ethanol stuff, we thought, oh, everyone's going to love this. You know, if we just pack this thing full of just the stuff that works, you know, Stuart and I had that thing where we said, okay, listen, if we're going to put anything in this course, it has to be something that has produced a huge effect and has to be super valuable. Otherwise, leave it out and only teach the, keep, keep refining it down to that, that cluster of procedures and approaches that just are the most effective, right? But it's weird. Some people don't don't like that. They don't like that the patient's done in a in a day or two. And I know I know that sounds it's it's almost unbelievable. You, in fact, I had a conversation with a meeting I had yesterday with a guy um, that's a that's a uh, that's a chemist uh, that's actually working with us on our new formula. Um, and was, and and he said he had the same experience. He actually makes another product, another topical, and he said that. A lot of guys don't want the patient to get better as fast. It's you know they it's bad for business, you know. So well, you know, and I mean I don't. I, I mean, eventually, 
eventually this is going to be forced upon them because big corporations like Amazon, Google, e eBay, whatever, not eBay, YouTube, they're all, they're all private. They're all going private insurance and they're going to be, they're going to be sending their patients to people to get results. Everything's going to be outcome driven and not you get a certain amount of money per visit. So like if you get $500 for back pain and it takes you 50 visits, you're not going to be making any money versus if you get paid $500, and you get them better in three to five visits, it's gonna, be, it, it's gonna, I think that's coming. It's already coming. <clears throat> and in five to 10 years, everyone's gonna be wishing that they, they started this process that now. Yeah, man, it's, yeah. I mean, it's a big thought. I mean, I, I don't, it's difficult to I me. Mean, I, I hope I didn't come across when I say that as being critical to people that are making a living, no. you know, living out of doing this, where, no. where, where they're like, you know, hey, this doesn't fit into my paradigm or my system. And I, cause I kind of put, I feel that man, I'm, I'm in people's shoes right now that are kind of in the trenches and, and go like, you know what, listen, I mean, reimbursements changed. Uh, we come into the realization that, I mean, I had to have that breakdown. A lot, a lot of the stuff I was taught in school didn't, didn't work. And I had to sit down and go, okay, listen, I need to admit that most of the stuff doesn't work. We've got to shed our skin a little bit. Um, um, but it's interesting to, I mean, the stuff, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think that's the way it has to go. That's a sensible way for it to go is for it to be outcome based and to be, you know, driven by cost and all that sort of stuff. So, well, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, low back pain is Philip teaches in his courses cost the U.S. healthcare system more money than cancer and diabetes, hypertension uh, and, and yeah, di combined. Di diabetes combined. Yeah, that's the statistic. Yeah. So, I mean, like. This is a this is a huge monetary problem that's only going to be resolved with results, and you're going to get paid for that accordingly. So it's it's not really a personal thing that I'm trying to push. It's it's literally like this is gonna this is gonna happen. And this is going to be forced upon. You. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I think I think maybe one one solution to it is to come away from that position where you've got to be everything has to happen beneath your hands. You know what I mean? Where you're, where you move away from being a mechanic to maybe being a little bit more of a consultant, um, you know, mm -hmm. to somebody with complex injuries to say, um, you know, I'm not necessarily going to be here and be the fixy kind of guy. I'm going to be more the consultant that kind of takes into consideration the full dimension of your thing and then your your condition and then fits in with you to help you fix this. I think that that may be a, a general direction to go. Um, you know, with it, I think that's probably, that might be a solution or the way to think about it. Um, yeah, but by the, by the way, Phil's course, I think, I think Phil's fit, fit into a beautiful niche, you know. Um, this idea that uh, teaching, you know, patient or respecting patient autonomy and essentially teaching the patient to be independent, I think that's also something that scares the hell out of people, you know, that are making a living out of fixing people. This idea that, oh, I'm going to go teach you to fix your own back. You know, initially, I think people, when they, when they hear that, I know there's people out there that go, oh, here's another chiropractor that's decided to package everything up and take money out of our pockets by having people go and do stuff at home. Um, I, I, I don't mm -hmm. think so. I think, I think Phil's got a brilliant product and it's a brilliant idea. Um, is actually saying that maybe, and that's something we teach in EFNOR as well, is to take the focus away from being, my job isn't to remove your pain. My job is to make you functionally independent and fully, you know, completely you know, for you to be fully rehabilitated doesn't mean out of pain. It also means in a position that you're more resilient, that you're more mm -hmm. engaged in your life, that you feel more complete as a person. You know, that's full, that's mm -hmm. full rehabilitation. It doesn't only stop without the pain. So if that's the goal, and my goal is to say that my goal is to get you functionally independent where you're absolutely fully re-engaged in your life and you're loving life and you're doing what you want to do and I've helped you get there from a state where you've been broken down and wondering what the hell's going to happen next because, I mean, pain is trauma to a lot of people. I don't think we appreciate that enough that a lot of people are traumatized and they're in fear about their condition. They're not only in fear that it might hurt, but they're also in fear about what does this mean and what does this mean to my life and it stimulates this you know, this debilitating cascade of thought processes and behaviors that come from that. And I think Phil's course where he's saying, look, I'm going to teach you an empowering system that's going to teach the patient to be independent and keep themselves out of pain and to be able to manage that, I think is brilliant. I think it's a brilliant product. And I mean, I, exactly. I, I hope it gets out to exactly everybody. Exactly what our healthcare needs. Absolutely. Yeah, it's exactly. And I, yeah, it, it, many courses are like that these days. Um, so that's definitely the, the, the wave of the future. And uh, Philip's on here, so hopefully he's going, 
he's going. He's going places. He's going international. Well, you say, well, you say um, many courses are like that, but I'm going to say that many courses might be fix your own stuff, but they also don't combine the um, being technically correct. You know what I mean? Being clinically correct and clinically effective. So I think Phil, mm -hmm. Phil's thing that he's doing there is all of the above. So that's quite nice, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. And his, the way that he taught me is the way I go, I go about back pain for the most part. And I always, you know, modify just on the fly when, ne when necessary. But that's my go-to. Yeah. Yeah, his, his algorithm that um, based on the research. Yeah. Based on what works. Yeah, man. Where, 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 Phil, where are you? Is Phil, Phil still watching this? Where, where is he right now? Yeah, he... He's on there. He's on there. Is he in Minneapolis? Where is he in Minneapolis? We can, yeah, he's in Minneapolis. We can bring him on here in a second, but you, you can't have three ways. If you want, if you want, so, if you uh, if you want to bounce me off, bounce him on. Let him talk for a little bit. All right, I'll, I'll bring him on. Bounce me I'll off. Bring you back on. All right. See you guys. Good right. talking to you, Justin. I'll, I'll hang around, but yeah. jump, jump, fill in here for a little bit. All right, sounds good. I'll talk to you in a bit. All right, man. See ya. You an outguest. Fill up. I'm trying to invite you. It says you can't join, Philip. Why can't you join, Philip? Hmm. Well, looks like Philip can't join, so we might just have to end this Facebook Live video. I hope you all enjoyed it, and well, there's just three of us now. So so, get you all later. Maybe. I can't even see any comments or anything. All right, ending this. Thanks, David, for coming on. Thanks, Philip, for trying to. No. All right, signing off. Thanks everyone for watching.